here where people attack you or your beliefs or your uh, manhood or your status, mm -hmm. your beliefs. It's been a real process for me of starting to um, disidentify from those things and beliefs that I thought I was. In other words, everyone who comes to this place has ideas, learned ideas of what it means to be a man and a woman, for example, with manhood. And a lot of the arguments, the arguments between the sexes and everything, get into, well, men, men are, blah, 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 women are. And what the Course is doing is, we were talking about this at Supper too about judgment. The Course is saying, you don't know who your brother is. You know, you, you've got a lot of judgments that you're laying on them based on what you believe you are. The deeper you go into this, you start identifying yourself more as a spiritual being. And you even get away from from identifying yourself with the world in many ways as, as it goes along. Another good example is like with the Red Fan stuff, that you know how it is when we get attached to a particular city or a particular team or a particular hero and somebody starts seeming to badmouth our whatever, you know how the defenses start to come up. So what I've learned is it's it, when my defenses start to come up, it's because of my mind's identity attachment to that hero. Also shows insecurity. Yeah. It's definitely a, a sign of insecurity. And it's definitely not lining with the Holy Spirit or Jesus in my mind, mind, because Jesus is teaching us that that if we start to disidentify from our attachment to a particular form, that we, we do become more defenseless because we, we start to identify with the spirit or the soul in, in each and every one. Insecurity really takes your question about insecurity. Is now that the mind is not so sure what it is, you know, it's got these two different voices in there, this is a state of insecurity. And what happens is the mind will attempt to use all kinds of defense mechanisms to kind of get around this insecurity or cover it over. In other words, you might have heard denial and repression and projection and all these different things. That literally the mind, the ego is quite ingenious in coming up with tricks that will minimize this insecurity and fear but will not let it go. Because the ego doesn't want to let it go. It knows that if you would ever let go of all the fears and insecurities, that the ego's out of business. <laughs> it doesn't have a life anymore, <laughs> you know, if that happens. So it's a kind of a sneaky mechanism where it's like, when you use a defense mechanism, it's designed to reduce the fear, you know, but it's not designed at all to eliminate it. And also when that topic falls up and you come above the other subject and you're trying to reduce that person. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then the you still have a, a conflict going on. Mm -hmm. And it's good practice going around for me just talking about these things because I really, I enjoy when people question and literally share share their views and perceptions. In a sense, when we were in Florida one time, we had a, a gentleman uh, who was a philosopher who we were we, being, we were having dinner one time at lunch and uh, and uh, a group, I, of group of us and I looked over and I said, hey Fred, why don't you come to our meeting, you know? And I heard all these groans up and down the, the table like in unison. Like, don't invite Fred. <laughs> you don't want to invite Fred to your meeting because you are going to be in trouble because Fred is like a philosopher who, who's got a lot of questions and wants to really get clear on all this stuff, you know, and he kind of raises all these issues. And it was like, great, that's what we wanted, isn't it? You know, why would we want to leave somebody out who of the sunship who, who's ready to ask questions, you know? So in, in fact, it turned out to be a, a tremendous four hours of really plunging into these things, you know? And, and if somebody has a belief or opinion and you notice a reaction or a defensiveness coming up, it has to be our own perception that's producing the uncomfort, the com uncomfortable feeling. In other words, Jesus was able to literally come and speak the word because he, he had transcended the ego system and there was nothing threatening. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, you know, the different groups that would come and say, blasphemy, how dare you say, forgive people's sins. No one but the Father can do that. And, you know, all these different things. And Jesus, like, was able to remain at this like above the battlefield, so to speak, because of his certainty of, of who he was. And that's all that the Course is doing, is just saying, when you remove all the falsity and these false beliefs, then you'll have that certainty too. And there will be nothing in the world that can take away your peace. To me, it's a lot of comfort in, in the sense, and it also helps me let go of some of my 
planning and trying to really fix people and change circumstances and change outcomes and just be more accepting and trusting, you know, knowing that things are working out, everything's working for a reason. The Bible says that too, all things work together for this. The Amish, the Amish had a belief that they, they, you know, if they were struck, they, they don't fight, they don't, they don't fight. So uh, they'd rather have harm done to them than them to do harm. You know, they, just, they would take it without ever coming back and they have to be sent in, in a physical, in a physical mission. Or, uh, and, and they, uh, I don't know, here a while back where all the barns were burnt. They had a series of uh, Amish barns that were, I think five or six barns that were burnt down. And uh, there was no, there was not a bit of nature in these people. Uh, harm was done to them. Or when a car crashed into five of their Amish children, they were all killed. And they had no remorse. I mean, they had remorse for the children, but they had no, no uh, vindictive nature toward the, infant, the boy that killed the children. But it, to me, that's a marvelous belief. I don't know if it's one that I can personally live with or, or work with. But I, I, and I guess what I'm, I guess what I'm getting to is that we have um, there's so many different ways to get to God as there are ways to get to California. We all talk about this and how to get there, but it's, we all end up in California or we all end up in heaven, but it's just different directions. And then finding out if any one particular one way is the right way, and there is no particular right way. They're all the kind of right ways, aren't they? I mean. In, in form, what the Course is saying is that there's many forms of the universal curriculum, but in a sense, in content, the whole thing, no matter what spiritual path, it's like transcending the ego, you know, so in a, in a content or in a mind sense, they're all the same, but boy, as far as schools and pathways, uh, you know, this is one among of so many that, that you can take, but that's that, it's, that just brings up a good point, because basically what the Course is saying is you still have a, a big distortion in this form content thing. Um, content is is purpose. So whenever we're speaking of content, we're thinking we're speaking of purpose. What is this for? In other words, the course doesn't so much ask the question, you know, you know, should I do this or should I do this? You know, should I watch the T V show tonight or should I go in and read my course? You know, and you sit there, oh God, what should I do? And, and what the course is saying is, what's your purpose for watching that T V show? You know, is it going to be a distraction, uh, something to go in and take your mind off of things, you know, and, tr and try to, to just forget your sorrows and problems by just doing that? Yeah. What's your purpose for reading the Course? I mean, a lot of times, you know, people can read the Course and just kind of move their eyes over the, the words and go, ah, this, is, this doesn't work, I'm going to leave the book. Mm -hmm. But what the Course does is really is, is asking is, what is your purpose? You know, that's the, the crucial thing, not what form where so many of the spiritualities can, can fall into this pattern of, of in a sense, um, getting into ritual or getting into doing things and somehow believing that if I do so many of a particular prayer or Hail Mary or do so many of a rite or a ritual or good, work. or good works even, that somehow if I do enough and accumulate them enough that that will kind of get me back. And the Course is saying it's the thinking that's the problem. Your, your behaviors come automatically from your thinking. So therefore, the only place that we can really have a significant, substantial change is, is changing the way we think. And there's only two thought systems in your mind, the egos and the Holy Spirit. So basically, the whole course of path is to help discern between the two. The simplest way to identify the two is that when, we have to get into a, this sounds a little bit scientific, but it's like cause and effect. For every cause, there's an effect. And what, what the Course is saying is there's only one cause with a capital C. That's the Creator or the Source. That's the capital C. That's the cause. And you are an effect. You were created by your Creator. You're also created in His likeness and image in the sense that you're, He's eternal, you're eternal. He's changeless, you're changeless. He's magnitude, you're magnitude. There's only one difference seeming difference between the, the Father and the Son. The only difference is that the Father created the Son and the Son did not create the Father. So this this path does differentiate. There are some New Age systems where literally says, I am God, you know, kind of a thing. 
where the where Jesus said in the Bible, the Father and I are one. But he always talked about the Father and I. In other words, in, in a kind of a recognition that there was, he always, whenever he would do anything, he would always point back to the Father. You know, don't why do you call me good? The Father is good. And, you know, he always was pointing to his Father. The ego picked up on this seeming difference. The ego kind of said, "Why should you settle for number two? You know, why why does he be the created? Why not be the kingpin? Why not be number one?" all by yourself where you literally are can make up a world where you're you're the kingpin and literally that's what this world is and is cause and effect are split off somehow like like the son could somehow be separate from the father and then cause and effect are turned around and backwards so that it seems as if the things that are happening on the screen of the world cause our emotional state you know even with other people, you make me angry. You know how when we're little kids we stomp off and we like, you make me angry, you know, or you hurt my feelings. And what the Course is saying is that's backwards. I hurt my feelings. By my thinking. By my thinking. My if I'm if I'm identified with the ego, that that's what hurts, you know, because that's denying my crisis. Um, if somebody seems to, to uh, steal from me, or somebody seems to harm me, like you were saying, it seems as if someone's harming me or whatever, the world would say, well, you know, you're just an innocent victim. You had nothing at all to do with that. You happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and, and this terrible thing happened to you. But the course is saying is that I am responsible for what I see, I'm responsible for how I feel, and I, I choose the goal that I choose to look upon. In other words, I can choose to see peace and healing in every situation, or I can choose to see, you know, separation and defenses and this and that. Now, a lot of the New Age systems and a lot of metaphysical systems will do that very thing. They'll say, you're responsible. But we were talking about this at dinner tonight. What happens when you take a, a, a thought or a mind-level principle, I am responsible for my state of mind, and you and you take a worldly perception down here in the level of form, we'll say cancer, and you put these two together. I am responsible for my cancer. Ah! You see where the guilt comes in from taking something from a level of form and taking a, a metaphysical principle of mind. I am responsible for my state of mind, and you and you kind of cross those cross pollinate, or you. You bring those two together, there's a lot of guilt. That's the level of confusion. This is That's the level of confusion that Barbara was talking about. Now, a question comes up, you know, right away is, is if I'm responsible, why in my right, nobody in their right mind would choose sickness. And I always kind of say, yes, nobody in their right mind would choose sickness. You'd have to be operating in the ego or in the wrong mind to bring upon, to even bring upon a witness from the world. Of, of sickness. And sickness is a very strong witness. So, in other words, the mind has to be in the wrong mind. It has to believe that it's guilty to call forth a witness from the world of the sickness. And the good news is, is that once we literally learn to, to choose and, and be in our right mind consistently, then we're free of the guilt. And therefore, you don't call forth witnesses from the world to bring forth, to reinforce that guilt. So that's really the only escape from, from all pain and misery and suffering. It's like you said, join with Jesus. <laughs> you know, if you're with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, if you can can discern, first discern between the ego and the Holy Spirit, and you understand that um, this is the fear-based thought system, this is the thought system of love, the ego is backwards. You know, it's always telling me that there's things out there in the world that are taking away my peace of mind. And also the ego tells us that there's things in the world that that give us peace of mind. That's the flip side. You know, I know a particular island where whenever I can, you know, that kind of thinking, I can go to this particular spot on this particular island. I'm always peaceful. It's when I come back to my job <laughs> that, I, that I lose it. To notice that that's backward thinking too, because as long as we think that there's things in the world that can give us peace or take away our peace, then we're literally codependent. To me, this is what the Course is saying, is like, you don't want to listen to that ego because the ego is telling you that you know there's things that you can get in this world that are going to bring you happiness and peace 
and it's a scam. You know, it's a big scam. And so the court basically is saying, you know,